Maybe I'm Casey, maybe I'm Casey, maybe I'm not. All right, very excited to have my friend Marcellus Wiley, the host of Speak for Yourself uh, and the author of this book. Oh, look at that. Did I got I love it. It's always up there too. I didn't even just put it up there for uh, for this interview. I swear, it is. But that's the problem. It's always up there. I don't think you've ever cracked it open. No, you know I how got, you teach I have a process, and, right? Like I got to read through all of them. But I represent yeah. though, right? Like I got everybody's book. I got Ernstein's book. I got Skip's okay. book. I got Poem's mm -hmm. book. His other books down here. You know what I'm saying? So I support the FS1 family. There it is. Love it. <laughs> but Appreciate thanks so much it. for joining us. Uh, I always wanted to have you on the pod, but I want to have you in person. Mm -hmm. You know, but then you got to do the show. So, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm happy to have you on. And all them kids I have, I got to get back home. <laughs> I'm in and out. I see you. It's like, hey, hi, bye. So I get it. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I, I, I feel uncomfortable asking anybody to stay at the studio longer than they need to. But I'm glad that you're uh, that you're on. There's a lot going on in the world. Uh, before we get to all of that, though, you have a new co-host, Emmanuel Acho. New FS1 mm -hmm. family member. Um, are you excited? When's he? When's he joining? What's going on? Yeah. Oh man, it's been so exciting just knowing him for a few years, and it's weird because I, I keep forgetting I'm 45, and like these cats come up to me and they're like, "Yo, Marcellus, can you like help me know some ins and outs of the business?" I'm like, I'm still trying to figure it out, but. <laughs> Because of age, uh, I'm more of a mentor to some. And I remember meeting him when I was at ESPN, and immediately his energy jumped out at me. I was like, this dude is about it. His passion, then his intelligence and how he just approaches every topic. And I've just been a fan of his from a distance, even though I knew him. And when this process, of his contract coming up, the ESPN, and he had options, obviously because of his talent level, uh, kind of walking them through it uh, without bias too, like not trying to recruit them. Uh, I was happy with Jason in our marriage. You know, he took up all the room. I was like, man, Jason say say some room in the car for me. But you know, it was it was a fun relationship. Uh, but walk, walking with Acho through the process and started to realize that it could be real for us. And he just has a point of view that he believes in, and he's going to be prepared, and he's going to express it with that same energy. So. I'm really looking forward to us going out there riding in the car and having a little more room because all he got is some little muscles. <laughs> got some little muscles. Well, we're we're excited to have him. Looking forward to seeing uh, the the relaunch of the show with him. Um, so you have a you have a very unique story which you you talk about in your book. Never shut up. Um, obviously, you're from South Central. We're here in Los Angeles. And went to yeah, yeah. yeah went, went to Columbia for college um, and you know you so you have a unique perspective obviously on on everything uh, that's going on here in LA with the protests and you know obviously what's happened in LA um, you know over the decades when it comes to police brutality and protests that have been here before um, so what's your what's your perspective on everything that's happening as far as the protests are going. Wow, I mean, this, this could be the entire podcast <laughs> and it could go for volumes, but um, it, I'm all over the place mentally in terms of where's my confidence, where's my encouragement, where am I disappointed? Uh, I'll be real, it's unfortunate that I've lived through this before. Like, just to even be a guy who can say, yeah, I remember when we had protests. I remember when we were burning and looting I remember when there were military tanks going down my street. I remember when there were store owners shooting at individuals just based on their perception of difference. Like, oh, if you're not with me, you're against me. And I saw all of that. And I also saw so many people in despair just looking for anything to grab hope from and to, to try and get them out of their situation. And unfortunately, I also saw everything come back to normal and continue as status quo as it was before. And then it's a head scratch because at the time I was a senior in high school before I went to Columbia. And then you go from L.A. to New York. And once again, you realize that there's so many different ways up the mountain, but we're all kind of climbing the same mountain. And it was a huge disappointment that all of that energy didn't materialize. So uh, things have progressively gotten better for us as a people. I don't want to lose sight of that. And I think it's unfortunate that you can't say that 
and seem like you're in full support of the cause because they're really like, what do you mean it's better? I, I tell you how it's better. My dad is from Texas, Tyler, Texas, the South. To hear him tell about overt racism, real discrimination, for him to get emasculated at times because he couldn't walk down the sidewalk with a white person and look him eye to eye, the effect on his psyche and the effect on how he looked at the world, it really conditioned him not to take risks. It's crazy. I come from two, two parents that didn't take risks with insane amounts of talent, but they made me. And boy, one thing I took was like, okay, give me some of that talent, but give me all the courage that you guys didn't have. And I've just been on a mission to just always step outside the box. So for me right now, looking at this moment, I just encourage everyone to really materialize it. It's not good enough to say I'm down with the cause. Be up with a plan. Like, do something. Uh, but also protect yourself from some of the momentum that is telling everyone it's not good or we're not in a good place. I am 10 miles from home when I go to Fox Studios where I grew up. And where I grew up, food stamps, welfare, despair, low ambition, gangs, drugs, poverty, you name it. Boys in the hood, yup. Men in society, yup. And now I am that same brother that hosts a television show daily. I'm not gonna lose sight of that beginning to where I am now, and this is not even the end. So I wanna encourage people of the progress we have made but still also let's go out there and have some fuel for some more change. Yeah. So to that point, you know, there has been a lot of conversation now with sports starting back up of, you know, Kyrie being, you know, the main, the main starter of this headline that, you know, if sports stop, start back up, it could be a big distraction from all the momentum that, you know, has been created from the protests and, you know, there, there's policy changes happening. Trump just signed an executive order you know, there's, yeah. there are things being done. There is some results coming from this. And, you know, Kyrie is obviously concerned. Um, you know, he voiced his concern, which I think that I think the headline kind of took a, a life of its own because the, the reports on how uh, how the actual call was are a little different than how it's kind of become now. But, you know, he did voice a concern that there could be a, it could be a distraction. Um, I don't I understand where he's coming from, but I disagree. What do you think about that? Yeah, I'm with you in terms of disagreeing. Um, I give it to Kyrie like it was given to me by one of my coaches. Uh, it's funny being where I am now in social media, and, uh, being retired from the game and watching how everything evolves. Whether you look at football from the perspective of the 80s, there was a day where the running back never caught a pass. And then Roger Craig came and he had a thousand yard rush to receive. People are like, oh my God, you could do that too. And now if you can't catch a pass, you're not playing running back. Like it's crazy, right? I remember when I was in Pop Warner and we used to beat our stomachs and we used to do six inches and coach would be like, beat it, beat it, beat it, beat it, beat your stomach. And then we got to like junior high and high school. They were like, beat it, beat it, beat it, beat it, beat your abs. And then I got to, to college and the pros and they're like, beat it, beat it, beat it, beat your core. And I was like, it's the same area, but how you look at things evolve. This is what I want Kyrie to understand. What focus is has evolved as well. Focus used to be throw one dot on the wall and stare at it. I am a football player. That's all I do. Eat, drink, sleep, play football. And coaches used to reward that. The culture used to say one thing and one thing only. I dare you to have an extracurricular hobby or activity. Coaches are like, you ain't focused. Kyrie, the new focus is have a million dots on the wall, but know how to prioritize them. Know the level of importance. And you see that with everyone. LeBron James has two trillion dots on the wall, but he knows how to prioritize them and handle them and not step in it. So it's a little antiquated, a little archaic to sit there and say, well, if I do this, I'm robbing that. You can walk and chew gum, Kyrie. You can do it at the same time. So. I'm with you. Let's move forward, play games, get the money, get the, the power from the platform and help monetize that. Well, I also think that it's important 
as you're talking about, you know, what's the next step, you know, have a plan and all of those things that I think it's important. And this is, is a big part of why this particular time in history feels a little bit different, right? Because you do have white people protesting. You do have Asian people protesting and Latino pe people protesting. You have allies, right? It's not just black people out saying, this is what's hurting our community. People are hearing it now. So I think it's important to continue to not have that message in an echo chamber. And if you have the platform of sports, which everyone wants to come back, then you, you people have to listen to what you say. They have to see you in the I can't breathe shirt. You, they're going to hear your press conferences where you don't necessarily have to answer the reporter's question. You can talk about whatever it is that you want to talk about. And, and, and specifically with the NFL, where, you know, there's a whole new vibe and wave with everything that's happening now. Roger Goodell talking about, you know, he'd be happy to have Kaepernick back. Um, so I think the platform is, is incredibly important now because you don't want to keep, you know, as, as much as we need to unite, we also need to keep the message going to to people who aren't hearing it yet. Do you think that there's anything to that, especially with the NFL? Yeah, I mean, there is some beauty to social media. Uh, you got to understand that this message gets spread instantaneously around the world in a second. Uh, these images, the, 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 the bad images, George Floyd's death, the negative, and the positive in terms of alliance and rallying, and it, it, it has no borders. Like when it happened in 92 with our riots, a couple of things were different. We didn't have social media, obviously. So you watched it through a consumption of media off of three channels, five channels, and they were able to leave some things on the cutting room floor based on agenda. So if I'm a white person way out in the suburbs, I'm like, what happened? They beat up that guy, got pulled over in the Hyundai. Oh my God, they're wrong. And then you, you were able to kind of breathe and get away from it until they came back on the news where social media is like, anytime you want to check on something, I'm right here reminding you. Another thing happened is the locale. Like we tore up Watts, Compton, South Central, Slauson. This one, they were on Fairfax, Wilshire. R Rodeo <laughs> like, Drive. Rodeo Drive. So physically it took a different course. And then in terms of optics, it took a different course. And I don't think back in 92 that people were sitting there like on the outside saying, uh, I'm against this. It's just like, you never invited me in or you never came to where I was. This is different. But in terms of platform, I, 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 I'm not one that believes in like this whole unification, this monolithic unification, because I'm, I, I look at it like in football. The first day of football, we're all on the same team. We all signed up. We're all on the same squad. And you know what happens next? Coach gives them a color jersey and gives you a color jersey. You're on the same team, but it's time to beat it up. We are going to war so that we sharpen each other's opportunities, our, our mindsets, our game plan, our skill set. And then we go out there and really tackle the real opponent, whoever they may be, whoever's going to get it that weekend. And I think we need to understand how important and how significant that is. As black people, we don't need to think the same. Stop it. Like this whole, you're a coon, you're a sellout. If you say something conservative or Republican and vote for Trump, whatever it may be, it's like, dude, you need that person to round out your argument, whatever you're thinking. So when you come with a plan, you've already thought of the counter arguments to that plan. So your plan is even better. But we like to get in the echo chamber. Oh, my God. If you don't say what you, if we all want to say it, if you don't say it, then what is wrong with him? No. What's going to be wrong with that plan once it comes to public consumption is where I am. So I just think that right now, let's get back to basics. What did John Wooden say? If you want to win a big game, do all the little things. Be a person of great character. Raise a, a greater family than yourself and try to accumulate the most in riches to give in terms of legacy and to hand the baton off to the next. In this relay, I'm not the anchor leg. You're not the anchor leg. We're not bringing it home. We're passing the baton to someone else. I think we lose sight of that at times and we just want everything to happen right now. Look at the progress over time. It takes time. Yeah, and it's progress, not perfection, right? So 
there, again, there's just got to be, there's got to be a plan and the conversations have to keep happening. So, uh, so let's segue a little bit out of, out of all of that. Um, the, the never ending, uh, contract negotiation. I don't, I don't know if you know, but I'm a big Dak fan. I'm a big Dak supporter. Big Dak fan or big Cowboys fan? No, 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 not Cowboys fan. Not Cowboys okay. fan. But I do like uh, that. I don't mean I don't dislike the Cowboys. Look, we we work for Fox. We love the Cowboys, even if we don't <laughs> love the Cowboys. <laughs> the Cowboys are the best. <laughs> but yeah. I do like Dak. Uh, I think he deserves to be paid, not forty million, probably not thirty five million. But I do think he deserves the contract, a good contract, maybe even a great contract. Because all contracts are the biggest contract, and then someone else makes more money, which Patrick Mahomes will. So we yeah. know that that's that's coming. What's your opinion on the Dak contract situation right now? In uh, in, in I, day seven thousand. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, uh, maybe I should tread lightly because uh, you're a Dak fan. But uh, <laughs> to be real with you, it's funny listening to you. He should be signed then because you said not forty, not thirty five, and they offered him thirty three. But they offered him 33 for five years, and Dak wants four years because when they rip up that CBA, he wants that jump and that boost, which is smart. Um, speaking from my own experience, look, you you throw $33 million at me per year, and I've only made $4 million in my entire career on the field. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I might rip the paper because I'm signing so fast and so hard. Like, ah. So I'm already signed. That said, I'm glad he has representatives in his corner that is protecting his future interests. Like that, there's a present value conversation, there's a future value conversation, and they're kind of trying to get over on you in the future one. Because we already know you're gonna get leapfrogged. Not only Patrick Mahomes, but Lamar Jackson, Deshaun Watson, like, just like Jimmy G, two years ago, Seven game starter Jimmy G was the highest paid player in NFL history. And people were freaking out. As they should have. Seven games? It's like, okay. I wasn't mad at him getting the money. I was just like, that's not the merit. Like, that's not merit based. That's no, not no, 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 no. <laughs> right? So, but now Jimmy G is like, what, 13th highest paid or something crazy like that? So the point is, if you're a DAC in representation, what is your real ceiling? It's not Patrick Mahomes. It's not really Deshaun Watson. It's kind of where you are right now, but four years and five years, I get why they can't make that agree. But if I'm that man, July 15th is the deadline. I'm waiting to July 14th, 11:59, and then I'm like, here you go. <laughs> yeah, I'm no, sorry. I'm I'm with you. I think it's a completely fair fair contract. What they what they have reported has been offered. My concern for him. And part of the reason why I like him so much is because he's durable. I like durable quarterbacks. I don't like quarterbacks that are on the sideline. That doesn't help me. I don't care how talented you are. If you can't play, you cannot help me. I'm just paying you to be that guy right next to the coach who's also not on the field. So it doesn't serve me any purpose. And Dak does not have that problem. Like Carson Wentz, it's why, like, you know, I think Carson Wentz is extremely talented. But, man, he's, you know, he's, he's kind of injured a lot. Like, it doesn't doesn't give me a lot of confidence. It's 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 always that with with Carson Wentz, and they're, they're always compared. I just think I would be nervous about Dak playing on a franchise tag. God forbid he gets injured, then that whole contract conversation is a different different situation. So to me, if I'm him, I'm doing I'm doing it just like you said. Last yeah. second, literally the la last five seconds. Let me make sure the pen is ready, and I'm signing <laughs> signing before they can change their mind. Um, yeah. All right, so the NBA is. Planning on starting again. You're obviously, uh, other than Clipper Dale, the world's most famous Clipper fan. Well, Billy Crystal. I mean, that, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like it's like the three of you. I actually love Clipper Dale. Good friend. Um, yeah, good dude. But I picked the, the the Clippers to win the championship this year. I'm sticking with that, regardless of how you know the the, the restart happens. However, right. something I've been thinking about because you know we're still dealing with the pandemic. I, I really feel like there's an opportunity for a big upset because what happens, God forbid, if Kawhi Leonard tests positive for Corona and can't can't play or or or, or anyone, LeBron James or Anthony Davis or anyone like it, it's it's available. We're dealing with the pandemic that could change the outcome of this season once it restarts. 
Then you read the secret. Don't put that out in the universe. But I mean, nah. I'm not trying to, but like, I gotta keep it real. You know what I'm saying? My team's back. The heat's gonna be there, but you know, it's it's gonna be really, it's gonna be very uh, an anxiety ridden finish to the season. I think. Yeah, there's a wild card based on the circumstances, based on the interruption, and and resuming going out there. Not only being ready physically, not only ready mentally. But getting back into the flow, the, the mindless behavior of playing sports at the highest level. We've all been there. I don't give a damn if it's PE class or in an NFL stadium. There's a moment where you get that glow where you're not even thinking and it's working. And I think the Lakers had a, a lot of those moments this year. Like they were rolling. Despite having a losing record against the Clippers, they still were playing their style of basketball longer and better than even my Clippers. But that said, you go back and you're like, you got to build from scratch. Some teams may go into it mentally thinking, oh, we're ahead of it because our record says we're ahead of it. That was then. This is now. And there will be a wild card factor in terms of uh, Boston sneaking in there. And, you know, Boston's right there, but they're on the bottom of tier one, if not top tier two. Maybe they leapfrog someone and get into the a real conversation for championship contention. So I still think it's the Clippers. It's, it's pretty obvious that we have the deepest team. Uh, the talent is second to none. I love the top heaviness of the Lakers, but I don't know their plan B. I know plan A is two-man game, Anthony Davis, LeBron James, and that's amazing enough. But when it comes to depth and the spacing of the playoffs in terms of scheduling and the rest, uh, the deeper team – won't be as fatigued and that should be advantage clippers yeah i think it's a, i think it's an advantage period to any veteran team in this situation because even though the circumstances are completely unprecedented vets also know how to train in the off season which is essentially kind of the space that everybody's in right now you know how, at what point do you start preparing for the season you know how do you change how you're eating like vets know how to do that younger guys might just be like oh you know i was healthy i'm cool like it's quarantine i'm kicking it they're not necessarily going to be in the same mindset that, uh, that the veterans are in. So I think like, I think veteran teams have a decided advantage, especially considering the fact that the only thing that I, that I will say though, is veteran teams, you know, vets tend to have families, whereas the younger guys don't. And this isolation factor of this, this bubble in Orlando, I think is going to play a huge mental health factor in all of this. Yeah, look, it's the gift and curse of both. Like you said, the veterans and the youngsters. The youngsters going to be in them streets more because, they, look, local Orlando uh, residents, be ready. It's like they're allowed to go eat outside the bubble. Go Are home. they? Um, yeah, be single in Orlando, ladies. Please, like, block out your, block out your Rolodex for about three months. They coming. <laughs> and they going to be out there like, what's up? What it do? That said, the veterans... You know, they're going to be more reserved in family, either missing their family because you can't always uproot and just come to a bubble for three months. Or, you know, the family's there. And then it's like, how do you compartmentalize and, you know, keep your space and focus in on your work, focus in on your family and focus in. And you guys are all in this E.T. bubble. Like, what, what is going on? So I think it's just going to be something that it universally affects the entire league. But people are going to take it differently. Uh, whatever that means, you're out of routine. That's why you typically play better at home than you do on the road. You do better on your pro day than you do at the combines. It's just that sense of comfort is going to be lost by all. Yeah, the routine is super, super important. Um, all right, well, before we let you go, tacos are my favorite food. Yes, I okay. love it. And apparently, I've, I've received this note from Heller, who is is on the Maybe I'm Crazy podcast, and is also your producer, that you, put, that you put ketchup on your tacos? Yeah, yeah. Why? What's up? Got a <laughs> oh, man. This, I, I, I had no idea. I got to keep it real, like from Hello. Okay. We were broke growing up, for real, real, real broke. Like, okay, so... I think it all started because, look, salsa is is a condiment, but it's a specialty condiment. Like, you only apply it on one or two things, two right. things. Ketchup is universal. Like, you throw ketchup on a lot of stuff. So I think because we were a little short with the change, mama said, look, we ain't buying salsa for these tacos, so we having ketchup. So 
day one, me eating a taco was always with ketchup. So I grew up, you know, that shapes my, my, my palate and I love tacos on ketchup. I mean, ketchup and tacos. So I, I go into the real world and all of a sudden I start feeling the side eye. I'm like, everything all right? Like you got green sauce and you got red sauce and I got red ketchup. And then I started to realize that people were like judging me. I'm like, wait a minute, dog. Have you even tried it? No, that's disgusting. I'm like, have you tried it? No, that's got that orange grease from that shell that you fried in that pan. When that that ketchup is hitting that meat and that cheese, all the best integration I've ever seen in this society itself, and you hit it with that sweet ketchup. First of all, ketchup is better than all other condiments. Let's be real about that. So I just do the best condiment on the best food, which is tacos. It's a win-win. You need to try it. Well, I don't I don't really feel like red sauce tastes that much different. Like mild red sauce is not that much different than ketchup to me. Is Boom. it is it Heinz ketchup? Uh, it depends on it could be Del Monte, it could be Heinz, it, it depends on the groceries. <laughs> I just don't get ketchup. I, you got wait a minute, you have a difference in ketchup like oh, I'm from I like Pittsburgh. I don't acknowledge other ketchups. Oh, I will God. say though, I yellow mustard is my favorite condiment of all yellow mustard then uh italian dressing are my favorite condiments of all i would put ketchup very high though i put ketchup on a lot of things but but this is the ketchup situation for me this is why i'm not judging you my grandfather okay. is from mobile alabama okay okay so grew up poor in mobile alabama yes. as, a, as a young girl i saw my grandfather putting ketchup in chicken noodle soup Yes! And my grandfather was in the army for 30 years, again from Mobile, Alabama. Command Sergeant Major did not play. He wasn't, right. I ain't with the jokey joke, everything ain't funny. So I'm like, yes. kind of teasing my grandpa about putting ketchup in the chicken noodle soup. And yes, yes. the verbal response that I got from my grandfather, I was like, okay, <laughs> A, there's no joking with pops, A. B, this is not this is not the territory. Like, if you want to put ketchup in there, there's a reason why. This is all we had to put on stuff. I'm like, okay, okay, I got you. So yeah. I don't I don't have the ketchup uh, judgment factor anymore because that's that's what Pop Taylor put in his and on everything. He always had ketchup with him. Yeah, my uncle Junior the same way. It's crazy. Like you really are like cutting at their core because they're like, look, this was a necessity at the yes. time, and now. Yo, yo, bougie luxury, eh? It's coming up in here talking about, I don't know, ketchup, excuse me. And that's how my uncle Junior, I'm not lying. People don't believe me. He would put ketchup on everything. I mean, everything. Like, whatever you thought, yes. And then one day, I, I think he was playing with me. He had a bowl of cereal. And he put a little ketchup. I think that was just like, okay, I put it on everything and let me just go too far. But I remember him eating cereal with ketchup. And I was he like, now. Nah, to prove a point. Yeah, he's probably going to prove the point. He ain't that broke. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm, it, I'm with you, though. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't do the catch-up judging. Uh, I wanted to ask you about your DJing, too. I see your DJ equipment uh, behind you. So yes. are there any songs that are, that are getting you through quarantine right now? Any vibes oh, you want to put us on? You know, you know, been DJing for 23 years. You know what I'm saying? Best in the game. They've put on cleats. You know what I'm saying? Whoever want it, come get it. You too. Um... That said, uh, I don't DJ like current songs anymore. I had to make a choice. Got a four-year-old boy, and I can't listen to rap around them because even if it's clean, you know what they're saying. And it's like, that's not so good for him. I'm trying to protect his innocence. So about four years ago, I, I made one of those conscious decisions. Like a lot of DJs, they go to an era. they like, I'm an era DJ now. So. I play old school stuff like golden era, 80s, 90s, 2000s. You know, I'm in that zone. Uh, but in terms of new music, I like it. I'm not one of those curmudgeons talking about all oh, these new rappers because we had whack rappers in the 80s and the 90s too. Like people like mumble rap. I'm like, have you heard JJ Fad? Like JJ Fad mumbled the whole song, and people are like, I don't know, I saw another one of Yeah, like like <laughs> it happens. Like. There are whack rappers and there are great rappers all the time. So that said, I play a lot of Calvin Harris, Rihanna. That's a it's in my UK. That's their favorite song. So I mm. probably play that the most of all songs. It's positive enough, even though they're kind of going to a little edgy spot. I'm with you. I'm not. I I love a good old school party. 
And like, it's, there's nothing like you're at a party and the DJ hits like one of those like 90s R&B yeah. jam, like you wasn't expecting and just yes. the whole mood. So, so now I need to be at a Marcellus party. They flood you as soon as you yes. hear something, you be like, yo, and then you just go back, right? <laughs> What's your DJ name? That dude. That dude. You know what I'm saying? I feel like that. Do actually. I have it right here? Is I knew that. It? Oh, that ain't it. I got it somewhere. I got my little computer. Oh, you got to see it. You see the other computer? Oh, I took it in the house. Man, I took it in the crib. I it, mean, got, it got a little face of me. It's crazy. I feel disrespected I haven't been invited to a party, but it's cool. I, I did a Super Bowl Fox event this year in Miami. Yeah, I didn't know the invited list until after I was in the booth. I was like, oh, not oh, a lot of us. Oh, <laughs> e oh, everyone's not invited to this. <laughs> I really thought that. I was like, oh. Oops, I, I, I'm glad I didn't tell a lot of people to come watch me spin. But you know what, being real, and I want to be humble, but also give myself some, some credit. I got to DJ for Outkast, Run DMC, Buster Rhymes, uh, Ashanti, uh, you, like, Ludacris, like, because I used to do all the NFL events. So, you know, they always had these big acts. Uh, Kanye West. Damn. I remember Kanye cursing me out, but he really wasn't talking to me. But he was talking through me because he was like, man, they didn't have enough Hennessy. And I was like, yo, I don't even, I don't drink Hennessy, so it ain't <laughs> on no me. But he thought I had to be his do boy because I was his DJ for right. that night. So I've been able to do some crazy things. Last story about that, my favorite moment. My favorite moment probably in music history is I'm in San Diego. And I used to, you know, this is before social media. So every time they do an interview with me, I'm like, I'm the biggest outcast fan. I'm gonna rent a Winnebago and tour the whole country and just go to their concerts. You know, I'm a Woodstock outcast. They heard about it. This is when I'm a charger and they hit me up. Like people laugh, you could DM somebody right. and they hit you back. They hit me up. I'm on the phone with Big Boy and they're like, yo, we gonna come to your town and we gonna rock with you. Come to our concert. But before the concert at night, let's hang out during the day. I'm like, boom, 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 right? <laughs> Losing my mind. We go to, they they said, meet me at the hotel. Go to the hotel, bring my daughter. We go to the zoo. They were like, yo, we in San Diego. Let's hit the San Diego Zoo with the families. And then we'll go to the concert at night. So it's like Big Boy and Killer Mike, uh, Sleepy, Andre. And we all spend the day together at the zoo and stuff. This is before cell phone cameras, so I'm not even like flicking it out. I'm just hanging with them at the zoo. Insane. I got like two pictures from it. This is not even the best part of the story. So then they're like, all right, go back home, change. We're going to go to the hotel, change. Meet us back here about 8 o'clock, and we'll pregame, and then we're going to the concert. Joy, walk with me here. I get back to there. It's, it's the hotel lobby, all that stuff. They all down there chilling. We jump on the bus. There's two buses. I should have known they were going to break up sooner or later because they had two buses, right? And they're like, Wiley, who you want to ride with? You want to go with Dre or you want to go with Big Boy? Big Boy is my closer friend right now. Like, Dre, I don't even see Dre. Don't talk to Dre. So I, I, I communicate with Big Boy. So I picked Big Boy then, even though Dre was my favorite of the two in terms of rapping. And I was like, Big Boy look like he's going to have more fun. Dre's, Dre bust looked like they had incense and, you know, <laughs> curtains. And they were just like, zen. I was like, I'm going with Big Boy. We go to the concert. It's like 10, 1030. And I'm like, when do they go on? Like, it's 1030. Like, come on, bro. You walk in with them, you know, the artist entrance, and you see on the board time they have to go on, like 1037, and the, the list of songs they're going to do. And I'm sitting there like, this is insane, mentally recording it all. And they're like, wow, they're standing right there. And then I'm like, all right. So the DJ's in the back. The curtain's down. It's the big arena in San Diego. Curtains down, I'm right on the edge of the curtain where it's gonna get pulled back. DJ behind me, Dre and Big Boy next to me, ready to go out. They go out, center stage, curtain still drawn, and they say, Y'all ready for this? And they were like, you know, they're like, Y'all ready for some outcast? And then they open up the curtains and say, Throw your hands in the air. I like, and I'm sitting there like, no one sees me. I'm solo, none of my teammates, none of my boys, none of my family, just me. And I'm sitting there like losing my mind, mosh pitting by myself. <laughs> and 
only record I have of that is me telling this story, and I'm glad <laughs> I had to tell it. <laughs> That's an amazing story, though. Oh, yeah. And That's I stopped short there because after it, getting on the bus and watching how people act when they see them, yeah. it's nothing you ever, ever expect or have ever experienced. It's crazy. But I feel like those stories, especially when you don't, like I'm the person on the trip that's like, I reach a, a picture quota. I'm like, all right, y'all, like, can we just enjoy just being yeah. present here? Like, I, I, I appreciate the pictures. I'm sure I'll love them later, but like, Enough with the pictures. One of those is great. Pick which one, whatever one you look the best in, that's fine. I, all my friends know ever, like when I'm done taking pictures, like, please stop. I'm done. I'm not, I'm being bad mood for the rest of the day. Cause I feel like you, if you really are there, like present, you experience, like you remember that so vividly cause you weren't on your phone the whole time, like recording all of it to then watch it back. Like you're just, you're just soaking it all in. That's an amazing story though. Yeah, but I wish I had the clout to actually show it too. <laughs> <laughs> Like a seat song, like, I'm going to drop like one on Instagram. I feel you. <laughs> well, thanks so much for hopping on with me, Marcellus. I really appreciate it. Looking forward to the uh, to the relaunch of the show. Um, hope you guys are, are staying well and staying safe. The family. Thank, thank you and much love. Man, I, I remember you like, you know, JT is like one of my football idols just because we came in together and people know it. I knew how insanely talented he was and I just, I used to always watch him like, like that dude is next level and it's just been great. And knowing you and seeing you at the players park a lot here and there <laughs> all over the years. And now we're in the same family, man. Much I know. love. Joy. It's crazy. It's crazy how it all turns out. It's all love though. But thanks so much, Marcellus. Appreciate you. Thank you.